everyone has had a plan A. Everybody's had a plan in their life that started with a dream. And somewhere along the road, whether it was a bump or an explosion, it tore, it ripped, it shredded, and then you tossed it into the trash can, into the garbage. You threw it away. You threw away a dream. You threw away the promise. Everyone has a plan. Everyone has a, a plan A of how they think their life is going to be. And I don't believe anyone, no one, plans for disappointment or failure or for shattered dreams. Nobody wants to, to realize that that's what happened. We don't plan for that. For some of us in this room this morning, we've seen plans and dreams come and go. We've seen that plan A that we had, that vision, that dream in our heart, we've seen that rupture and break. We've had our own thoughts and our own dreams that have gone by the wayside. And we leave, we're left asking the question, so now what? Or we've had even God-sized dreams, God-initiated dreams in our heart that, that never quite came to the fulfillment or have not come to the fulfillment that we thought that they would. The question becomes, what are we going to do? when those dreams come crashing down, when, when they become shattered. Those good and noble dreams, as well as those plans that maybe we have been whisper, have whispered in our ears since we were tiny, those, those goals and aspirations. What do we do when those things don't come about? Or, or if we're on the pathway to, to that dream, for that plan, and, and something happens, or someone happens, and things change, and it's not quite the same. Did, did you see last week during the, the NCAA finals, uh, the regional finals, a Louisville player, his name's Kevin Ware. Did, did you see what happened to, to Kevin Ware? Or maybe you heard about what happened to him? He shattered his leg, broke his leg, and with his leg, shattered his dream. He's not playing on Monday night in the national championship game. His team is. That's exciting, but, but he's not. His dreams and his hopes lay shattered on that basketball floor. Now, from everything that I've read, the dude has, like, this really upbeat attitude, and he's, he's, he's praising God for who he is and where he's going. But in that moment, in that time, when his dreams were shattered, he had a choice, just like we have choices when our plan A's don't start working out the way that we think they should. We have a choice. Let go and let God or have a pity party. Live in the paralysis of the moment. Live in weakness or run and hide in fear because of what's happened. Or we start blaming others for the circumstances in which we find ourselves. The shattering affects us. When dreams shatter, it truly affects us. We run, we cry, we freeze, and we try to take control. It's somewhat of a natural instinct, isn't it? If, if, if you imagine yourself on, a, on an airplane, and the airplane is, is in the death dive and is spinning out of control of the ground, what do you do other, th other than pray your life? What do you do? You want to take control. You want to do something. You want to grab control and pull with all your might, with all your muscles, with all your strength. You want to pull that lever back. You've seen those movies. You've seen the impossible come, come happen. You've, you've seen that, that plane on its way down, whether it was in a cartoon or a sitcom. You've seen that happen in the, the star or the, the role. They, they grab the controls and they pull and they pull with all their might and doesn't, they're going to make it. And then all of a sudden, the last minute, they dive down and they make it back up. So many times in our shattered moments, we begin to try to take control control, to bring things back to a place that we know, back to a place of plan A, back to the, back to the place of a, of, a, of a dream that we had. We want to make it happen. We want to arrive at our destination, our dream, on our time scale. But I want you to understand, folks, that's not always reality. The truth is, too many of us have, have experienced the fact that we cannot pull out those last-minute heroics in our strength. We know that's true. We've experienced that, although we have tried. We've tried to take control and, and not trust in God in the moment. We've tried to, to grab hold of the situation and fix it because we're fixers. That's what we want to do. We want to fix things. And this is another reality, and I believe this with all my heart, that in order for us to understand what it really means to live out and live through shattered dreams, we must rest in the lie. 
I know it may be counterintuitive. I know that when the dream is broken and our hair is on fire, we must resist the urge to want to fix it ourselves. We must follow God's plan. The Bible is full, full of stories about everyday men and women, men and women just like you, men and women whose plans did not work out, men and women who had dreams that seemed to die. The Bible is full of people who are trying to figure out what to do with a life that was not turning out how they expected it. Maybe, just maybe, you can relate. Maybe at some small point in your life, or maybe at a, at a big place in your life. And you might be there right now. What do you do when things don't work out the way that you expect, the way that you thought, the way that it plays out in the fairy tale? What do you do? The Bible is full of all kinds of folks who tried and failed, who sinned and repented, who dreamed and risked as dreams were broken and flames were ch- plans were changed. David is one such individual in Scripture that we, we, we see his story. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to find 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 21, and, and stick your finger there for a second. And I want to do a little bit of, little bit of housekeeping as we get, get ready to get going this morning. We are, we're, we're launching out in our, our Plan B teaching series, and we're going to be in the this series for the next five weeks, and each week there's going to be in your bulletin um, some, some reading. There's some resources there, and, and there's a five-day reading guide of some scripture, and, and I really believe that this scripture will kind of complement what we talk about, what we teach about each and every week, and I invite you and encourage you and challenge you to pick that up each and every day. Um, this week it's, it's some, some readings from Psalms. I, I believe they will encourage your heart, and they will remind you of God's faithfulness as we walk through this Plan B series together. You know, plan B is what happens when plan A goes out the window. We come up with our, 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 our next step and our next story, and, and that is plan B. Um, Pete Wilson is a pastor of a church in Nashville, Tennessee called Cross Point Church. And in 2010, he wrote a book called Plan B. And, uh, and, and as I was reading through that book, I really felt strongly that God said, hey, we need to walk through this as a church family. There's some issues here that, um, that, that we need to, to camp out on and walk through as we understand what it's like to live with shattered dreams. Uh, Pete Wilson's in Nashville, like I said, and and he has some pretty famous folks in his church there in Nashville. And uh, can't you imagine living in in the city that they're in, dealing with the people that he deals with? There's a lot of ups and downs that come with uh, the music industry. Living the dream and then being crushed by the reality that the dream didn't quite come about the way that you thought it might. In reading his book, I, I saw more and more about how people deal with disappointment. I realized how I personally have dealt with disappointment in my life and somehow how I let that disappointment deal with me. I pieced together things that I had known and I believe that we all probably know together but we've never really verbalized how shattered dreams often become opportunities to blame. To blame others and a lot of times to blame God. We ask questions like where are you God? Where are you God? Where are you God when when my plans, when my plans don't work out the way that I thought they would, or even the way that I thought you said they would. Where are you, God? Where are you, God, when, when we miscarried? God, where are you when he got cancer? God, where are you when he cheated, when she died? Where are you when the factory shut down? Where are you when we lost the house? God, where are you when the rehab didn't work again? Where were you, God? Where were you, God? Or maybe you ask, why, God? Why? Why? Why me, God? What did I do? What did I do to deserve this? Was it something I did do, something I didn't do? Is this a test? I don't do real good on tests. Why would you give me a dream and sit back and watch it shatter? Why can't you fix it now? Because God, this hurts. A broken dream hurts. A broken heart hurts. A broken vision hurts. A broken life, it hurts. I don't like pain. I don't like pain. And God, I know that that pain sometimes causes you to grow and 
causes you to, to understand and causes you to grow up and causes you to, to lead like you need to be led. And God, I know that sometimes through all that, I know that you can have a plan for my good. I know that you can, but God, this hurts. And I'm not sure I'm ready to be dependent upon you because being dependent on me is what I'm used to. It's what I know. Plan A is what I know, God. I have this plan. I have this map. I have these, 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 these set of drawings, God. And I know that, I know that where, where that leads me. God, why? Why me? Why is this happening? Questions are real. Questions are real. And, and you know, God's big enough to answer your questions. He's big enough to take your questions. And I think all too often, we don't get to a point where we understand what it is that God is teaching us in shattered dream moments because we don't listen. Or we get impatient. Or we don't like paralyzed, or we take matters into our own hands. And either way, we make a situation entirely about us and our wants. The Bible speaks so well and so often to this type of behavior. David was the sort of guy that, just like me and you, he was a nobody. He was a little guy. He was the last son. He was a shepherd. He was out in the fields. David was just like us. He didn't have a heritage or a, or a lineage that, that said he would be anybody or anything. He was just a sheep herder in a family of sheep herders. But God had a plan for David. Beginning in 1 Samuel 16, you can read the whole account, and I challenge you to do that, but, but all the way back through there, we can see God appointing David as the new king. God put a dream and a promise in the heart of David. David was a man after his own heart, and God sent the prophet Samuel to him to anoint him as king. Small problem. There's already a king. His name is Saul. We'll get to his story in a second. David was the, the sort of kid that, that, that wanted to please, and, and he did that with his, with his brothers and with his, with his father, and, and now with Samuel as he points him king, and we realize that God has a plan for his life. Plan. And that part of this plan for David to become king is because Saul, the current king, has disappointed God, has disobeyed God. The Bible tells of Saul's um, appointment as well as, as a king earlier by the same prophet Samuel, but it also tells that God regretted making Saul a king. God regretted. Now, that doesn't mean God made a mistake. Don't hear, hear me say something that's not there. God doesn't make mistakes, but God regretted making Saul. that dream and that hope and that desire in David's heart. Our conversation this morning centers on David and his kingly dream. And his dream is not so different than lots of ours. I don't believe that his dream early on was that of, of kingly grandeur and castles and crowns, but rather of serving God and serving God's people. God placed in his life a noble dream. He doesn't know how, he doesn't know when, he only knows that God said, you will be king. Now this is David who goes on to battle Goliath. Remember Goliath? Big dude, bad breath, big sword. Remember, remember Goliath? He had a bad attitude, Goliath. And he serves the current King Saul, which is kind of weird. He's going to be the next king. He hadn't told Saul that, hey, God's maybe the next king. But he serves the current King Saul as a servant, as a musician, as a warrior. He marries the king's daughter. He, his best friend is the king's son, Jonathan. David becomes an important guy. He has power and influence. He is on his way to actualizing this, this dream, this plan. Plan A is working. He is moving on up. He's getting there. He's going there. And maybe you felt that way at times too. Where you're just clicking on that dream and you're just moving on up and you're, you're notching up, up, up. And you're getting to where it is that you know that you want to go. In David's battles, he's very successful. And, and people begin to sing songs about Saul, about Saul killing his thousands and David killing his tens of thousands. You can imagine the, the, the radio stations of that day playing that song and it becoming very popular. And, and the king, you know, he's got a radio too. He hears those songs. He hears, them. He hears about himself being sung and killing his thousands and David killing his tens of thousands. And he does what many of us do when things become uncomfortable. He becomes a little, a little jealous by them upset by them. Some time passes, and, and once, 
over, over a period of what You know what happens to David? He's sitting at the king's feet, basically, and he's playing his, his harp and, 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 and singing soothing music, and, 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 and the, the, the mind of King Saul has, has, has raced and gone so many places, and he's become so jealous and so enraged, he takes a, a spear and throws it at David. I mean, talk about a cartoon kind of moment. I mean, he throws it. I mean, I could see a fork, maybe a spoon, but a spear at dinner? He throws it, and David kind of goes, hmm, this pathway to whole king dream might take a detour. It might not be easy. It might not be nearly what I thought it was going to be. Because he's probably thinking to himself, you know, dead men can't become king. It becomes obvious that Saul is not just going to hand over the crown. God's dream for David was not going to be easy. It would be difficult. And there's a life lesson that we all sometimes want to skip over right here. There's a life lesson that we don't want to believe. Dreams take work. Dreams take work and struggle and pain. They are not easy. But if we're obedient, we see those dreams come to pass. Realizing Saul's murderous heart, David does what many of us do when times get tough. What do we do when times get tough? The tough get going and he did he got out of there he got out of there david flees and he lies and he becomes false with people that he knows and he's somewhat of a coward he runs away i want you to see for yourself first samuel chapter 21 we pick up the story as david is trying to skip town forgetting the dream of being king the dream is shattered and it takes matters into his own hands chapter 21 verse 1 david went to nob to emelech priest. Amalek trembled when he met him and asked, why are you here alone? Why is no one with you? See, David's on the run. And David's usually surrounded by his warriors, by his guys, by the, by the, by the folks with the armor and the shields and the swords and all that kind of good stuff, because David's a warrior. David usually has an entourage, because when he goes places, he really goes places. And the priest goes, what are you doing here by yourself, David? Why aren't you armed? Why aren't you, why aren't you ready for battle? Why aren't you doing what you normally do? David answered, Amalek the priest, the king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Liar, liar, pantaloons and fuego. That's not exact Spanish, I know. But you know. All right. He's running for the, from the king. He's running from the dream. He's getting out of town because plan A is shattering all around him, and he hadn't quite figured out what plan B is yet. So he's taking matters into his own hands. And he's run to the priest, and he's getting provision. Verse 3, now then, what do you have on hand, he says to the priest? Give me five loaves of bread and whatever you can find. Now, the only bread the priest has is called the bread of presence. Now, this is special bread. It's not bread that we, we really understand very well, but this is bread that's, that's sacred unto the Lord, and only the priest may eat it. And David is demanding, priest dude, give me that bread. He steals what he's got. He is compromising his character. He ran away. He's lied. And now he's compromising his character by taking what is sacred to God. He stole it. He sacrificed his principles, his beliefs, to save his own skin, to keep in control of the environment that he's in. David runs from the king to Nob to the priest to get provisions and rations, and he's preparing for a journey with whatever he can find by whatever means necessary. Jump down real quick to verse 18. David asked him, Amalek, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. Liar, liar, pantaloons and fuego. Warrior David without a spear or a sword? Sounds a little fishy, doesn't it? He runs away, and, and, and then he asks about not only provisions, but, but, but weaponry, and he doesn't, have, he doesn't have the tools of his trade. He's not ready. And he goes, and what happens? Verse 9, the priest replied, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elijah, Elah, is here. It's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. Take it. There is no sword here but that one. David. Goliath's sword. Hmm. Goliath. Oh, I remember that sword. Big sword. Big sword. Hmm. 
Big trouble, big sword. I like it. Goliath's sword. Now, David had a problem before with, 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 with utilizing things that didn't fit him. Way back in the day when he was a kid, King Saul sent him actually into battle against Goliath and tried to put his own armor on David, and David realized it doesn't fit. I can't do what I need to do with Goliath's outfit on, I mean, with, with Saul's outfit on. We're having kind of the same situation again. Here's Goliath's sword, this, this sword that he took off the dead giant after he killed him with God's power, in God, with God's courage. You, know, you, you would think this sword, the only sword available is Goliath's sword. You'd think there's like alarms ringing in his head. David, hello, God here, saved you last time. I've been faithful to you before when the odds were stacked against you. That would be one of those, you know, here's your sign kind of moments. This is Goliath's sword. But David, David, he can't quite give up control. He's thinking to himself, you know, the sword ought to mean something more to me right now than just a sharpened weapon. I don't have time to quite think this through. I'm in a hurry. The king's after me. I'll take it back. Give it to me. In fact, goes on to say in verse 9, David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. Verse 10, that day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has sang his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. I told you they sang songs. I told you. David his ten thousands. The enemies even know the songs about David. They know his reputation. They know what he does. They know that has been with him in the plan that God has for him. But David, he is still reeling from a broken dream, a crushed plan, and he runs to the enemy of his enemies. Verse 12, David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on doors of the gate and letting saliva, 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 run down his beard. He acted like a crazy man. So we have this guy that's on the run. He's lied, he's cheated, he stole, he's pretended to be a madman in order to preserve himself from the dream that is shattered in the forefront. When we're taking control of a situation, we'll do anything. We'll lie, we'll steal, we'll pretend, we'll compromise our morals, pretending to be something that we're not in order to get something that we want. Hello? show of hands. Some of you might. Have you ever pretended to be something that you're not in order to get what you wanted? Like a drowning man grasping for anything to hold on to, David is just flailing. He's flailing. He's trying to get a grip on what to do. He's trying to take control. I want to let you know that in that moment, when you have nothing else to hold on to, God is desiring, God is beckoning, God is cheering you on to take a hold of him. Now, I want you to understand something. This is a trash can. It is a ginormously awesome trash can. Johnny King made this trash can, so yay Johnny. All right? But this trash can, not only is a trash can, but I, for, for, for your mental reference purposes for a second, I want you to use your imagination. I want you to stretch out this trash can for just a second. In the, the wrestling match, in the wrestling ring of your life, I want you to understand, when things go bad and things go wrong and you're getting beaten up and your dreams are shattered, you need to realize something. This is a tag team match that you're in and God is waiting to be tapped in. God is waiting to be tagged in to the match, the wrestling match that you're in. Yes, your plan may be, wrong, may be gone, but I promise you this, that in, in plan B, God is there. He has a plan for you. Too often, people like me, not like you, people like me, we're hard-headed and easily offended by looking to escape and blame and try to recreate our dreams by ourselves all over again. Not you, me. That's me. I'm hard-headed. Even when, when David is reminded of God's faithfulness, that, that sto in the story, that sword just rings. I mean, for, for me, I'm seeing that sword, I'm going, Wow! It's like a beacon. God, you took that great big old sword out of that great big old man's hand when I threw a rock because I was faithful. And I'd be thinking to myself, oh, wow, God, 
this time. My plan is out the window, but God, I know you have a plan because your plan is way better than my plan. It's way bigger than my plan. The dream that you have for me extends way beyond what I can understand, what I can comprehend. Goliath's sword, he only saw it at the moment as another tool for controlling his situation. He was lying instead of relying, controlling instead of trusting. My question for you this morning is, what do you do when your dreams are not coming true? What do you do? Are you relying? Are you trusting? Or are you retreating? Are you running? I want you to know that despite our current circumstances, what the world whispers and shouts, God is there for you, working things out for your good, church, for your good, Christ follower. Romans 8, 28 tells us, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Pete Wilson, the author of the book that I was talking about, and I encourage you, if you want to grab that book, you can find it pretty cheap on Amazon or, or uh, christianbooks.com or something like that. It's, it's, it's a great book, it's a great read. He, I, he asked this question, what would you do? What would you do if you really knew that God was with you? How would that change how you live, how you breathe, how you act? What would you do if you knew that God was really with you? If you trusted, if you had confidence, completely, utterly relying upon God, what would you do? I think that's the question that we have to answer for ourselves. That's the place that we have to go. Because when you have a dream, when you have a dream, you have hope for what is to come. When you have a dream, hope for what is to come. When you don't have hope, you're not going to ever get that dream. And that shattered plan, that shattered dream, it's just going to stay shattered. I'm going to fill in the blanks this morning. It's pretty, pretty simple, pretty easy. When you have a dream, you have hope for what is to come. And the second one there is, when the dream is threatened by an unforeseen circumstance or turn of events, at that point, we have a choice. At that point, we have a choice. Trust God or try to control. Trust God or try to control. Now, God may restore your dream. He does that for David. David becomes king. He restored David's dream. In spite of where David went and what he did, he restored David's dream. He becomes king. For others in the Bible, like Job, God doubles the dream. God takes Job from, from where he was and goes through horrible and difficult, awful situations, and he comes out the other side God doubles the dream. For others, the dream changes. For others, the dream changes, and the plan Bs of life become even better. So where are you? Are you in the middle of a plan B? Are you in the middle of an audible? Are you in the middle of, of a place where you didn't think you were or should have been? Or maybe you're, you're still in, in plan A and you haven't realized yet that it's not working out the way you thought it might. Or, or maybe you're in that, that plan A and, and the ground is crumbling underneath you and you're just wondering what you're going to do next. I want you to understand that, that wherever you are, there's hope in his name for you. He took the blame for all of our plans, all those things that led us away from God. Jesus provides hope for the dreams. He died for those plans that you and I made, and he gives us a promise of an unbreakable plan, God's plan, that you'll be saved and place your trust There's a fundamental question that's asked throughout Scripture. And it begins very early on in Genesis 3. God asked Adam and Eve, where are you? God knows fully well where they are. But he wants man, he wants Adam, he wants us to answer that question. Where are you? Are you with me? God wants to know. Or are you going your own way? Are you trusting? Are you controlling? God asked that question for David and for Saul. He asked that question for Adam and Eve. He asked that question for Peter when he denies Jesus. And then Jesus asked him again when he loved him. Where are you? That is the question for you and I. Planning and running or trusting and embracing Jesus. Where are you? God can take those shattered dreams and breathe restoration and give grace and healing. I'd like to just share with you this morning. There's 
a group here this morning that um, you're not exactly sure where you are. Or you do know where you are and you know it's not good. It's not good. And this morning, I just want to invite you. I want to tell you something. You need to be saved from that, from that place that you are. God is calling. He's beckoning. He's waiting to be tagged in to your life. He's inviting you to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. He's inviting you to actualize and realize the dreams that He has for you. That plan A is not the end of the world when it gets shattered. That He has a plan B for you. You may think it's second, but it's never been second. It is not. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And He desires. He desires for each and every one of us to embrace that plan. This morning you're at the crossroads and you have to decide to trust God trust yourself. Take matters into your own hands. Lie, steal, pretend to get your way. Or trust Jesus and get God's good way. Let me pray for you this morning. Father God, in this sacred moment, in this time that we have to get up together, God, I just pray that you open hearts and minds and ears to your word. God, thank you. Thank you for shattered dreams. God, thank you for, for dreams that are are reformed. God, thank you for allowing us to redream the dream. Father, we pray that you put dreams and plans in our hearts, specifically this morning, that unbreakable plan, that plan that you have for us to save us, save us from our sin, those things, those places, those plans that we follow that take us away from you. Father, this morning, I pray at work in that man in that woman in that shattered circumstance in that place of pain in that opportunity to run God I pray that you're right there in the midst of what's going on and God that you're giving peace and comfort and God that you're calling out you're reaching out I promise you Father this morning we gather to tell you we thank you. Your love is never failing. It never gives up. God, you continue to reach out to us. Help our hard-hearted selves see that in the shattered dream, in the broken plan, that God, you make a way. You make it right. It's not what we will do. We're not strong enough. We're not good enough. We're not right enough. God, you are all those things this morning. I thank you for giving yourself for us. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray.